when you niggas gon' unite and kill the I've been on the air with Professor Mark Lamont Hill several times in several different formats. Uh, I was always treated fairly, given a chance to say my piece, was never harangued, never called any names, and I, no, I, I developed a respect for Professor Hill, and I think it was mutual. So I was always, you know, he kind of moves around a lot. I remember sometimes he'll say something in politic. Next thing you know, he gets kicked off, but he shows up somewhere else. Now he's over at BET. And we have so much respect for Professor Hill here. We're going to name a regular segment after him from now on. And that segment is called... The question of the day is, with all the injustices, the harassment, and the aggression that we see toward black people every day... Do you feel unsafe around white people? <laughs> Drop your thoughts and we will read them throughout the show. So, I mean, it's, it's a provocative thing to, to think about given all that's going on in the news. And I As the lovely ladies say down at the Acme where I do my grocery shopping, a real man don't talk about it. A real man is all about it. So let's check out some recent videos that may contribute to our understanding of this question of the day. Rest in the shooting death of an LSU student and gas station clerk. Deputies taking 22-year-old Antonio Watts of Port Allen to jail tonight. He is accused of gunning down 29-year-old Fardazul Ahmed in a gas station robbery Saturday morning. News News Johnson Van Springer is live from the Violent Crimes Unit tonight. Johnson, how did uh, deputies track down Watts? Well, Sylvia, it was a concerned resident that reached out to sheriff's deputies that eventually led them to Watts, who was taken into custody this afternoon, just five days after Mohammed Farouz Ulamin was shot and killed. And here is Antonio Watts being escorted here from the Violent Crimes Unit shortly before 9 o'clock tonight. Quiet and expressionless, he was led to a sheriff's unit and taken to the East Baton Rouge Parish Prison. Now, it was around 3.30 in the morning Saturday when Ulamin was shot and killed while working at Mr. Lucky's gas station along Airline High. Highway. And once Watts was taken in for questioning this afternoon, the sheriff's office says he was cooperative, confessing to shooting Ulamin and provided other key details. One of the things people in the academic business love to talk about is intersectionality, which basically means white dudes are not just uh, racist against black people all the time, everywhere. That explains everything. No, we're pretty much doing bad things to everybody all the time, everywhere. That explains everything. Women, Arabs, you name it, we're doing it. That's the fairy tale. Here's the re here's more of the reality. That's two Arabs in one week. The search continues this afternoon for two men accused of murdering a 29-year-old woman. She was killed during an armed robbery over the weekend and today was laid to rest surrounded by family and friends. 7 Action reporter Jennifer Ann Wilson joins us live with more on this heartbreaking story. Jennifer Ann. Yeah, what a, a gut wrenching day. I got a chance to spend the day with an incredibly generous and warm family, and now am kneeling in the exact same place where Sajja Al Janabi's closest family members now just hours ago you can see the flowers they left for her the incense that was burned as they said their final goodbyes, still wondering who ripped her life away and why. Broken and in anguish. Crying out to God, a prayer central to the Muslim faith. There is no God other than God. With every step, they pray for mercy, knowing their daughter, their sister, their friend is in God's hands. Saja Al Janabi's family carries her today as she has so often carried them. She was like fun, kind. She makes sure everybody's okay before she goes to sleep. If you ask her for help, she's going to help you. Friday night, 29-year-old Seja Aljanabi was brutally murdered on Bingham near Moross in Dearborn by two men police say robbed at least two other people in the area at gunpoint. She was visiting family. Her final breaths were in her younger brother's arms. Because she's a really important person on her, in her family. She helped us left and right. I don't know how I'm going to pay everything to her, what she did to me and to my family. It really hurts. Today is family and friends lay her to rest in Maple Grove Cemetery saying their final goodbyes. They pray for peace and they pray that such as murderers are found. Find justice for her so that way she can rest in ease in her grave. 
Well, as you can see, the flowers here, and there is still a lot to be done. The family would like to build a memorial here at the cemetery for her with benches and a garden. And if you'd like to contribute to that, we do have the GoFundMe link on our website. Meanwhile, I have spoken to the chief of police in Dearborn, and he says they are still looking for those two suspects. They're described as one short man who is wearing a white mask and black clothes and a tall man wearing black clothes. They were driving a white sedan Friday night. They are still looking for those men who were in the midst of that armed robbery crime spree. If you have any information at all, contact police. The final days of the state fair were even more chaotic than first thought. So we've told you about the woman hit by a car and a shooting outside the main gate on the last night of the fair. But Jay Cole has uncovered new information about other outbreaks of violence inside the fairgrounds. Jay. Well, most people know about the shooting and the woman who was hit by the car just outside the fairgrounds here. But what happened inside the fair on Saturday night is also troubling. In fact, one source tells me State Fair Police Chief Paul Paulus told multiple officers he thanked them for their job on Saturday night because, quote, we almost lost control of the fair. State Fair Police Scanner audio shows just how close things came to spiraling out of control that last Saturday night of the fair. Send every available officer from Zone 4, Zone 5 to the Mountain Midway. Cover your backs. Officers then scramble to stop the outbreak. She possibly hunted it. The haunted house. We have 20 people fighting, all described as being in Somali. A short time later, another one. You got a big fight They're running uh, north of the way. Just past uh, Mini Donuts. Another head towards the haunted house. There's probably only 50 kids. Another with injuries. Turns and Underwood. We have a man down, 20 people fighting, medics are responding. The state fair has confirmed there were nine fights that final Saturday night between 7.30 and 11.40 p.m. Just about every hour with one state fair police officer assaulted and five arrests made. The victim in our assault may be at Shanghai to Henry's. He came up and said that he was being chased of a group of 15 to 15 olds now, said he was assaulted and does not know the group. Then officers moved to sweep the midway. We're going to march it out. 12 people on each side. So the squad start to assemble. Scanner traffic from the final night, Labor Day, also shows chaos inside the fair around 7.30 p.m. where a fight broke out with mace being sprayed. They're requesting medics for a juvenile that was hit with this and that they possibly fed his well. At the same time, according to Scanner Audio, tracking a gun by the grandstand. Be the east end, the lower grandstand, you're going to be looking for two black males, one of which had a hand black in color. And moments later... Gun recovered. Gun recovered. Now, we want to be perfectly clear that the video you see in this story is all from Monday night. That's from Labor Day. That was the night that the shooting and the woman was hit by the car outside the fairgrounds here. We've tried multiple times to talk to the state fair to verify these accounts that you heard on the scanner, but they've refused to give us an interview. In fact, besides just verifying the assault numbers, they've refused to talk about any of this on camera. No, so... We've never been safe in the presence of white people. There is an increased um, likelihood of police interaction, you know, because of the idea that we're unsafe. And he pressed against me on top of me, and he started biting my face. He bit my nose and broke it. He bit my chin and my neck, and he started scratching on me. And Agonizing words tonight from a woman attacked in broad daylight in downtown Mobile. She says a man jumped in her car sexually assaulted her and tried to kill her. Very hard to listen to, but this survivor wants to tell her story. It is graphic and a lot of details about what she says happened at around 7.30 yesterday morning, all after stopping for breakfast. Artori Thornton sitting down with her tonight. He's live in downtown Mobile where this brutal incident allegedly happened. Toy, this is awful. Yeah, definitely one of the hardest interviews I've ever done, Lenise. Sitting across from her, I could really feel her pain. This grandmother has bruises on her neck, scratches on her face, and horrific memories of what happened yesterday morning in this parking lot. He said, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill you. And he did, he tried it. A woman now broken after the unthinkable happened to her. And then he was choking me. He wouldn't. He had one hand on, on my neck so hard. I honestly thought I was going to have a heart attack. 
The grandmother was minding her own business Wednesday morning, stopping at McDonald's on government for breakfast. She says this all started with a man asking her for 20 cents. All of a sudden, this man is in my car, and I, and I said, get out of my car, get out of my car. And that's when he, he grabbed my mouth, and he pulled me, and then he, he, he kept groping on me and he said, I want your money. I want all your money. Give me all your money. She never imagined a quick stop for food could turn into a brutal attack and attempted rape and sexual assault. I'm going to start crying. That's okay. Because they start touching me. And touching himself. Police say this man is responsible, Vincent Scott. He was just released from jail the day before. I don't know how this man got on top of me. Because I'm short and I was at the wheel. And he pressed against me on top of me and he started biting my face. He bit my nose and broke it. He bit my chin and my neck. And he started scratching on me and feeling and lifted my ball, my top, and went in my pants. The woman says at that point she felt hopeless, as if she was stuck and her life was going to end. But then she says an angel in the form of a young man came to help. He went inside and there was a fireman, Mr. Cox, and he, he had his blue uniform on. He looked like a police officer. And he came to the window and he said, open the door and get out now. When, the, when he said that, the man finally let go. That's when police say Scott got out of the car and ran. She says he was still threatening to kill her. Full recovery will take at least six months, she says. But today, she's just thankful for life. It was just the Lord putting angels around me. I know this. And another disturbing part of this story, the woman says some people were standing around watching, recording the attack on their cell phones. They weren't even trying to help. HPD still looking for the fourth suspect involved in this. This was about a 30-minute crime spree and chaos that ended with an officer shot over here on Tristan Street. He was hit three times. The suspect who fired the weapon is dead. It all started with a carjacking at a Valero on Scott Street. But the owner of the SUV that was carjacked knew that the four suspects were not going to get very far. The complainant advised his vehicle was on fumes because he did not have an opportunity to gas up. Police say the four suspects ditched the SUV a few blocks away on Tierwester. Minutes later, they allegedly pulled a gun on a priest in a church parking lot on Maribor, even pulling the trigger twice, but no shots were fired. Four suspects then physically beat the priest and took his cell phones. Three minutes later, the suspects were spotted by the HEB on Tierwester. Uh, officers start chasing suspects that are running on foot. At within one minute, one male suspect is taken into custody. Police say two minutes later they spotted another suspect on Tristan, who then allegedly opened fire on officers and they fired back. One of the officers was hit by three bullets. He was quickly loaded into an ambulance and taken to the hospital. Police say the suspect who shot at the officers was killed. To me, he ain't doing no wrong. Just shot a cop. When you niggas gon' unite and kill the police, motherfuckers. When you niggas gon' unite and kill the police, motherfuckers. And most people think black people can't be racist either, by the way. That last video was kind of weird because at the press conference, the chief was very explicit about who was hunting and stalking the people of Houston. He said, yeah, you heard me right. That was a preach was approached by four black men. They kind of left that out of the video account of that. Anyway, down in Fort Lucie, Florida, a whole group of the fellas crashed into a house with some white folks in it. And uh, lots of gunfire, lots of argy-bargy. Please, sir, I want some more. I guess we shouldn't be surprised, despite Professor Hill's comment despite the answers he got on his show that black people are under constant threat from white people when out here in the real world we're seeing we're documenting the obvious I guess we better be a little careful with that because doing that well I'm pretty sure that makes the black kids angry when you niggas gonna unite and kill the police motherfucker